The book of Joshua today, we begin in Joshua chapter 1, a new leader, a new plan, new priorities for the people of God. We really turn the page in the book of Joshua. Father, sanctify us by your truth. Your word is truth. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Now, just stop there for a second. Moses is known as the servant of the Lord, and Joshua is known as the son of Nun. And I think uh, that pretty much sums up the tough position that Joshua finds himself in, following a great man, many would say the greatest of all Old Testament saints. Tough job, big shoes to fill. Verse 2, God said, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, to the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. For 40 years, any thinking person in Israel would have said, Moses is the one that we need. If we need anyone, it's Moses. He prays for us, he leads us, he shows us God's way. But Moses is dead, as God says. And by his death, God is going to show that he, the Lord, is the only indispensable one because the plan of God goes forward. The plan of God is bigger than any one person. Verse 3, Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given to you, as I said to Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even to the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and to the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. The UN never would have approved of making Israel a nation, especially with these borders that God laid out. But according to God, he said, my globe indicates that this land is Israel's. Verse 5, there shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not fail you, nor forsake you. In other words, Joshua is going to be successful. Not just because God said it, but because he will be with Joshua, making sure that his promise comes to pass. And that's one thing about God. You know, the Bible says God performs his oaths. He doesn't just make them. He makes them and he performs them. So no one will stop Joshua because no one can stop God. <clears throat> Six, be strong and of good courage. For to this people shall you divide for an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give them. Be strong, be courageous. Joshua must be confident. He cannot show signs of panic because there shouldn't be any panic in him. And if Joshua panics, it spreads and probably leads to another widespread rebellion against God. Joshua, like, any, like anyone else, needs to know that he's in God's will and then pursue it with everything that he has, knowing that God is with him. Seven. God says, only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. And you see the, keys, the key for, to success for Joshua and for the Israelite army is to be obedient to God. And that obedience is especially important for Joshua because he's the leader, and leaders either lead by example or they don't lead at all. Eight. 
This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then you shall make your way prosperous, and then you shall have good success. In other words, read the Bible. Read the Bible. Talk about the Bible as much as you possibly can. Those things will lead to obeying the Bible, which will lead to success for Israel and for us today. Being what God wants us to be begins with a choice. A choice to take in as much of the Word of God as we possibly can. That gets the ball rolling. Verse 9. Have not I commanded you? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid, neither be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And notice how God just keeps hitting on this theme. And don't overlook the first part of verse 9. Have I not commanded you? God commanded Joshua. That's the key to him being courageous. God commanded him to cross the Jordan River. God commanded him to lead the army of Israel against the Canaanites. And since God never commands us to do something that we cannot do with his help, Joshua can be courageous and should be confident. It's a matter of faith. Once God commands, it's a matter of faith. 10. Then Joshua commanded the officers of the people. So, God commanded Joshua, and Joshua now speaks to his military officers and commands them. What does he say? Verse 11, pass through the host and command the people, saying, prepare you provisions. For within three days you shall pass over this Jordan to go in to possess the land which the Lord your God gives you to possess. Everyone in Israel had to carry their own weight doing their part. If they want things to go well, that's what has to happen. And that would include being ready to go when Joshua says go. 12. And to the Reubenites, and to the Gadites, and to the half-tribe of Manasseh, spoke Joshua, saying, Remember, these three Israelite tribes were given their territory on the east side of the Jordan River, where everyone is standing right now is we read verse 12. They're all on the east side, but that's where their territory is going to be. And Joshua has a special word for those three tribes. 13. Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God has given you rest and has given you this land. So God gave these three tribes their land on the east side with a condition. And the only way to get off to a good, fresh start in their new home is to obey that condition. So notice 14. Your wives, your little ones, and your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side of Jordan, but you shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them. So obedience for these three tribes means leaving their families behind and going into the mainland to help their brothers conquer their portion. 15. Until the Lord have given your brethren rest, as he has given you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God gives them, then you shall return to the land of your possession and enjoy it, which Moses the Lord's servant gave you on this side of the Jordan toward the sun rising. So because the other nine tribes are family, the three tribes should help them to get what they themselves already have. And that's normal. If you care about someone, you're not going to be happy unless they're happy. 16. And the answer Joshua is saying, all that you command us, we will do. And whatever you, wherever you send us, we will go. Whatever you want us to do, we'll do. We'll help our brothers fight. And we'll do whatever type of fighting you think we're best suited to. 
Joshua. They're looking to Joshua completely. 17. According as we hearken to Moses and all things, so we will hearken to you. Only the Lord your God be with you as he was with Moses. The, the three tribes say, we will obey Joshua. But not unconditionally. They will obey him as he follows the Lord. No one deserves our unconditional obedience. Obey those in authority over you at any level, but say no if they command you to do something contrary to the Word of God. You have to draw a line in the sand there. 18. Whosoever he be that does rebel against your commandment and will not hearken to your words in all that you command him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of good courage. So they're really laying it on the line. The military must be disciplined. Meaning they must force themselves to do what they sometimes do not want to do. And it's the same with us Christians. We must obey the Lord even if our friends are not obeying the Lord. Even if our feelings are not in it. You say, well, that's hypocrisy. No, it isn't. That's discipline. That's sacrifice. That's commendable. Let's go into chapter 2. And Joshua, the son of Nun, sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went and came into a harlot's house named Rahab and lodged there. And obviously... The spies were kept secret from the people of Jericho. And this is about, this, this, is, this is talking about keeping it a secret from the Israelites. I mean, obviously, they didn't tell anybody in Jericho that they were spies. So when verse 1 talks about keeping it a secret, it's keeping it a secret from the Israelites. Joshua didn't want anyone to think that he was afraid or that he was doubting the promises of God about taking the land and therefore sent in these two spies. He, he didn't want that word to get out and because he wasn't afraid. He just did it because it was wise. Two, and it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men in here tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And you can bet that the king of Jericho knew all about Israel. He, he didn't respond by saying, well, wh who's Israel? He knew all about Israel and her powerful God. And you can bet that he had people watching Israel like a hawk, spies. And that's how he learned that a couple of spies had entered the city. Verse 3. And the king of Jericho sent to Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that are come to you, which are entered into your house, for they be come to search out all the country. The only thing these two spies did in the public house of harlotry owned by Rahab was to use it as a hideout. They used it as a base of operation. And they were discovered. Four. And the women took the two men, the woman took the two men and hid them and said thus, there came men to me, but I knew not where they were. So, Rahab's covering for the two spies. She was a pagan who now has faith in the real God. And at the risk of offending her king, which would mean death if caught, she hides the Israelites. She lied, which is probably not good, but her sin does not cancel out her faith in God, which is the thing that's going to save her. 